In 2020, the United States saw one of the most massive protests take place in our nation's history. The George Floyd protests that summer came with an endless wave of opinions. I'm out here because I am 73 years old, but I've seen this kind of madness for far too long. It's time, it really is. Nobody's asking to get away with anything, just justice. Some felt that they were a signifier of hope, that maybe there could be some progress happening. Companies at least tried to pretend as if they cared about racial inequality, even though we can assume that they most definitely do not. Meanwhile, others saw the protests as outrageous and examples of anti-cop rhetoric, chock full of unneeded violence, uproars, and property damage. We didn't have protests last night. We had criminal acts. We didn't have people mourning the death of this man, George Floyd. We had people capitalizing. His death is on their hands. One of the reasons for this overwhelmingly negative view was the news. During the summer, they almost exclusively reported on the violence of the protest, even though an overwhelming 97% of cases were peaceful. This was what began as a peaceful protest in Santa Monica and now has turned to some mayhem. A dozen businesses were broken into as protesters filled the streets on Milwaukee's north side. Protests turned destructive in downtown Seattle tonight. Here's what we know. The breaking news as the George Floyd protests turned destructive in parts of Manhattan. But something else lending itself to the immediate outrage was a strong sense of support for police officers. After all, they were supposed to be the good guys, right? At least that's what the movies, TV shows, and even the news tells us. For our entire lives, at least as Americans, we've been told over and over and over and over again that cops are the heroes, and they have been portrayed as such on shows like NCIS, Law and & Order, and even kids shows like Paw Patrol. We almost always see the police as the good guys in film and television and fiction. They're always there to just stop the bad guys. This certain media phenomenon has actually been going on for so long that there's even a name for it, copaganda. As the media does their jobs to produce content that frames cops as the do no wrong good guys, it has made any type of criticism towards law enforcement that much more difficult. And this was done with intention. It has made reform virtually impossible and it has forever altered the public discourse revolving around police brutality. But why is this even happening? The media is meant to be a critique of society and expression through art. So why the hell are we seeing the same cop stories on repeat and what does it mean for us as a society? Well, that's the focus of today's episode and that's what we're here to talk about. So hello, I'm the Illuminati and this is The Corporate Casket. Back in the day, cops in the media were not portrayed in the best of lights. In fact, prior to the 1920s, when you saw a cop on TV, you were usually about to see a scene of complete and utter incompetence meant to make you laugh at law enforcement's inability to do even the most simple of jobs. In 1917's Easy Street, Charlie Chaplin even played a police officer who was only able to save the victim after apparently sitting on a drug addict's needle and picking up superpowers from the accidental injection. I'm not gonna question the logic there, that's a whole different thing entirely, but that's pretty much about as incompetent as you can get. Police and media were almost always used as comedic relief and displayed as inept buffoons that were constantly being mocked by the others in the film itself. And the people gleefully watched the boys in blue fuck up in hilarious manners time and time again. And to a degree, that is a reflection of reality if we take a look at pretty much any point of the news cycle ever. After a while, law enforcement officers were pretty sick and tired of their comedic representation. So they went to work trying to change media as we know it. And as you know, because we're talking about it today, they succeeded. They would take back their representation by force. In 1908, the New York mayor shut down every movie theater in New York City with the police leading the charge. And two years later, the Association of Chiefs of Police drafted a resolution that adamantly condemned the media for the horrible portrayal of their industry. Soon, even the Supreme Court would step in and say that movies were not worthy of First Amendment protection. Now, it was perfectly fine for media to be censored with no legal recourse. Eventually, that ruling would be overturned, but this was the very least of the industry's worries. 
And just, I'm sorry, but is it too early for a tangent? I think not. Can we just put that in perspective of today for just a moment? And unfortunately, I like to say it's hypothetical, but unfortunately with how the Supreme Court's currently sitting, nothing's hypothetical anymore. I'm looking at you, Justice Clarence, with the many, many trips. But of course you guys are just, just besties. Anyway, could you imagine that there's a case that goes before the Supreme Court and literally they're like, yeah, um, cops look bad in the movies and we don't like that anymore. And the Supreme Court agrees and go, actually, yeah, like this form of art, not protected. Yeah, you talk bad about cops, you're liable. Actually, interestingly enough, with all the rules that are being stripped away and how in some like states and counties and stuff, you can't even protest anymore. I guess this isn't really hypothetical anymore, but I digress. That's apparently a conversation for a different day. Now, before long, the movie industry would become reliant on assistance from the LAPD. So what a twist here. And why you might ask? Well, because their stars would continuously do illegal shit and they required help covering it up. So yeah, they essentially needed protection for their stars that were homosexual because again, at one point in time, that was illegal. I bet you were thinking I was gonna say they were all doing mountains of cocaine. Nope, not really. They were just being who they were, but society hadn't caught up with that yet. Apparently they needed to play nice with the LAPD who are pretty famous for their corruption. So much so that LA is actually now investigating the 50 year police gangs. And apparently LAPD has 18 police gangs, which is bananas. But Hollywood couldn't critique any of this because they needed the police's help to hide their various misdeeds and force permits and work as security on set. One day, an actor named Jack Webb decided he had the solution to the problem and a way to make both Hollywood and the police happy. And what was that solution you might ask? Well, it was to involve the LAPD in the production of a movie. Because, ah, uh, yeah, what could go wrong with letting the police completely control the narrative about themselves? There's no way that that could have any unforeseen circumstances on society, right? But Hollywood needed the approval of law enforcement and law enforcement needed Hollywood to stop portraying them as hopeless buffoons. So Webb and the LAPD chief, William Parker, entered into a partnership to create the movie Dragnet, which was quote, an authentic look at police work. They didn't stop there though. This wasn't just a movie, even though it started that way. Soon, the groundbreaking partnership between the LAPD and the industry rolled into a radio show, then a TV series, and law enforcement was involved every single step of the way. The TV series was released in 1951, and they were not only working as extras, but they were controlling the entire narrative. The scripts were formally approved by the LAPD Public Information Division, and if there was anything the department objected to, the entire episode would be thrown in the trash censorship at its finest. The story was presented as being undeniably true, which it wasn't. It portrayed a diversified LAPD, even though they were still segregated at the time and seemed to completely miss the fact that LAPD cops that same year had beat seven men for an hour in an incident so badly that it was later called Bloody Christmas. So much for authentic. But that didn't seem to matter to literally anybody. And this new model of working with the LAPD to develop media content soon became the norm. And thus, Copaganda was born. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing it. Basically, Copaganda is just defined as, quote, the reproduction and circulation in mainstream media of propaganda that is favorable to law enforcement. It can be anywhere from TV shows to movies and even the news. Copaganda is after one goal and one goal only, to make the police look good. Gone are the days of the comedic punchlines and the inability for them to do their jobs. Now, police were displayed almost exclusively as the heroes, the folks there to help and those who can do no wrong. And this new form of media, this Copaganda is very, very effective. I even remember as a child watching, you know, certain movies or TV shows or whatever, and seeing cops and investigators and stuff like that, doing their thing, solving cold cases, all that kind of stuff. And it was so damn fascinating to me as a child. I was like, this has got to be the coolest job ever because you get to solve crimes, you get to help people, you get to save the day, you get to bring closure to these families for things that have happened to them and stuff like that. And the problem is, is that's exactly what Copaganda does. It takes especially young people, but everybody, and goes, this is good. This is what you want to be when you grow up. Thankfully, I did grow out of that, as you can obviously tell, but when I was younger, it absolutely did make an impression on me. So I'm not sitting here and saying like, I'm some immune pyramid to all of this and I know better and blah, blah, blah. 
I fuck up just like everybody else. And though I'm not gonna say what I did as a child being like, oh my God, I watched this TV show with this cool police officer solving a crime. And I thought it was really cool. And then I wanted to be one that that's the biggest fuck up in the whole world. I think that just shows that this was effective marketing and that this is something that still continues to this day. And on that tangent, you've probably seen propaganda yourself more times than you can even count. You've just probably never realized it either. So let me go ahead and help you out. Let's take a look at some examples of propaganda as seen on TV, shall we? Now, we've already talked about Dragnet, and that was pretty much the beginning of the end, but that's way back in the 1950s. People have had time to perfect this ability to make cops look extra special and awesome for quite some time now, and propaganda is quite literally everywhere. There's a seemingly endless amount of cop shows that grace our televisions. In fact, they make up about 20% of all the shows on broadcast networks. By the way, that doesn't even include predominantly legal dramas. Now, not all of them are participating in the traditional propaganda method. Some actually do critiquing, but others, not so much. It's just like a little love fest and, you know, licking the boot, which, mmm, yummy, yummy, boot tastes so good, am I right? If you ever see me writing that on a comment in one of my YouTube videos, just, just know that that person probably deserved it. But anyway. Let's talk about Law & Order, for example, which is one of the biggest franchises in American TV history that has been on our screens for literally decades at this point. And over the years, it seems like almost everyone has been on the show. Not only do we see successful actors on the show repeatedly, but we even see politicians making their mark on American media by appearing in the crime series. The show has become so massive that people often use it as a reference point to describe just how much they know about the law, which when you think about it, is pretty terrifying. What makes it even more concerning is that Dick Wolf, the show's producer, who worked previously as the ad director, had followed pretty much the exact same playbook as Dragnet. Sure, cops and prosecutors do not necessarily have the same access to law and order in the way that they did with the famous 1951 television series, but they do have a heavy influence on Dick who has even said explicitly in interviews, quote, You know, there is a shared interest in uh, putting bad guys away and having cops, you know, shown in a decent light. I am kind of unabashedly pro-law enforcement. So when someone has that type of view and is producing a show watched and loved by millions, it's reasonable to think that they won't be portraying things in a completely accurate light or a socially moral one. In fact, in a study done by Color of Change, they found that the cops on the show were often shown doing bad things for a good reason. While in stark contrast, the criminals were not given the same explanation. They were simply bad for the sake of being bad. And what was the result? Viewers became much more likely to believe that bad or illegal acts done by police officers and prosecutors are just simply necessary evils that are totally acceptable. I'm sure that doesn't have any bearing in the real world. Right? I'm just kidding. That was obviously sarcasm. It does. But we'll get to that a little bit later on. It's no wonder why cops are big fans of the show. I would be too if my job was shown in such a damn good light. Now then there's also the whole design of the show. If you've seen an episode, you probably know the structure. A bad person does a bad thing, cops arrest a bad person, and the bad person goes to trial. It's kind of the same formula every single time. But in reality, this type of scenario isn't actually how our legal system works at all. In real life, about 90% of criminal cases never even make it to trial because people end up pleading guilty. What the show does get right though, is that most defendants who do choose to go to trial do end up getting convicted. And those are some fucking staggering numbers that you would never really know unless you have been through the criminal justice system yourself or have done quite a bit of outside research because a cop prosecutor centered show is not going to tell you that our criminal justice system relies on people pleading guilty to crimes, even if they are innocent, to avoid the very high possibility of a harsher sentence if they go to trial. But of course, there are a lot more examples than just law and order, even ones you wouldn't guess like Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And you may be thinking, hey, Illuminati, pump the brakes. That show doesn't necessarily show cops in the best of light. They are comedic in a sense, and it isn't supposed to be accurate portrayals like Law and & Order and Dragnet. Well, you're right, but you still have to look just a hair deeper than that. So yes, on the surface, the show is definitely making fun of cops, but it also shows a disconnect between what we would hope would be the reality in police departments and what actually is. When Raymond Holt first comes onto the scene as the gay, black, NYPD officer, he faces discrimination. 
But slowly and surely, he is, as the Washington Post puts it, turned into a mascot of departmental tolerance. The great aspect of this storyline is that it does show that the NYPD is certainly not perfect by showing the initial discrimination, but it also seems to exaggerate the department's capability of reform far beyond what is accurate in reality. Simply put, it's sugarcoating. And this type of sugarcoating seems to be pretty traditional in the cop genre. And many shows display a picture of diversity within law enforcement that is just nowhere close to reality. Shows on TV that portray law enforcement often put a heavy emphasis on diversity, which is great for representation of more people of color or in the LGBTQ media space, but it isn't so wonderful for the truth of what most police departments really look like. While they are full of diversity on TV, they aren't in real life. In fact, only about 15% of police officers are black in the United States which is a horrendous underrepresentation of what our population actually looks like. But there's more because there always is. Cop shows also have a nasty little habit of portraying most criminals as people of color and have even portrayed people intentionally harming themselves purely so they can place blame on cops for police brutality. In an episode of CBS's Blue Bloods, a black subject literally throws himself out of a window completely unprovoked purely so they could frame a white officer for police brutality. Clearly, this type of narrative is detrimental to those reporting actual instances of police brutality in the United States, and there's a lot of it. But these types of televised examples gives police at least some reassurance that they can simply claim that people are making it up to get some sort of payout or to make police officers look bad. And since these types of episodes sit in the back of our head and a lot of people go, huh, this must be what it's really like, they lend that credibility of a fictional event in a show to reality, and it makes no sense whatsoever. And what's extra shitty about it is then the police weaponize that mindset that people are now being curated into believing, and they absolutely just use it to get shit dismissed, even when that's not the truth. For a local Colorado example, which I'm sure for anyone in Colorado, you've been keeping up on this and it's probably pissed you off too. Do you guys remember back in the beginning of this year that a woman was suing the police because she was locked in the back of a car and then put on train tracks and then the police car was hit by train tracks and she was severely injured? Which did I mention she was handcuffed in the back of that car? She had no, no recourse, no escape, no action. Anyway, she sued the police and the police officer who placed her in the cruiser that was then hit by the train, he's pleaded not guilty and wants the charges dropped. And what's really sickening is in local circles here and stuff like that in Colorado, there are some people that absolutely fucking defend this shit. And I see them spouting off to their like thousand followers on Twitter. And I'm just like, can you be embarrassing somewhere else? Like she literally was like a mouse in a fucking cage. And then they put that cage on the fucking train tracks and let it hit her. But because we've got this instilled sense inside of us that like, oh my God, well on law and order, the cops are good. Therefore, even if this cop did a bad thing, it must've been for a good reason. People try and defend this shit. And I'm like, there is no defense here. I know legally there has to be because they have a defense attorney. But my opinion, no defense here. You can't do that to somebody and get away with it, but they're fucking trying anyway. And I hope they don't. But anyway, I digress again. Point here to say is that copaganda is so pervasive that we can even find it in kids' TV shows. I mean, there is literally a show that is all about adorable puppies helping a person solve crimes. And the main character of which is a cop. But there's also more nuanced instances like Peppa Pig, which can't believe I'd ever be discussing Peppa Pig, but here we are. In one episode, officers visit a classroom and are met with cheers from the kids. Hooray, the police. For the rest of the scene, the police teach the class how to ride their bikes. They are the helpful, the involved adults. As black and brown kids are receiving lessons from their parents about how to keep safe from police officers, kids shows are giving a completely different lesson. Police officers are always the good guys who are just simply there to help. Obviously, kids don't need to be seeing the reality of police brutality, but they also don't need to be seeing a sunny, watered down, unrealistic version of law enforcement either. How about we just keep law enforcement officers out of kids shows altogether unless they're documentaries made for children, which that's a thing too, by the way, very interesting might I add. Yes, copaganda is everything everywhere in media. And as Amber Ruffin says on The Amber Ruffin Show, copaganda is the most effective and long running ad campaign of all time. Portraying police in a negative light can come at a cost. The creator of The Wire even had to testify in front of the Baltimore City Council about the negative image of Baltimore depicted in The Wire. But it's not just fictional media that is running this long running ad campaign. 
it's the news that does it too. Now, before we continue on to talk about the news cycle, and then of course, obviously how all of this collectively is impacting us as a society, I'm gonna go ahead and place today's sponsor here because this next section about the news and, and propaganda is gonna talk about police brutality. It's gonna have some moments that are gonna be a little bit serious, perhaps even a little bit too much for some folks to hear at the moment. So I'm gonna go ahead and place a sponsor here give you a minute or two to think about it. If you want to listen to it, you can skip to the next section or maybe that's the end of the episode for you today. Either way, here's a sponsor. And hello, yes, today's sponsor is me. I just wanted to let you know that over on multilevelmerch.shop, the merch shop, if you didn't know we had one, surprise we do, we have a limited edition collection called the Natural Collection that is available now through the end of the month and 50% of proceeds from anything in that collection are going to be going to the Rainforest Alliance. This limited edition design is only gonna be available through the end of the month and we're taking it away. So make sure to grab it while you can. It's super cool, super amazing. And of course it features a very fun phrase, arsenic is natural, which it is. And then just a cute little reminder that natural is not a regulated word in the US. So feel free to grab those while you can. We've got shirts, hoodies, hats, stickers, cups, you name it, we have it. Grab them while they're there. Multilevel merch dot shop. Links are in the description box or the link tree link, whichever way you'd like it. Thank you so much. Please know that this section will discuss death and police brutality. If that might be a little too much for you to hear at the moment, please feel free to skip this section. Now, propaganda doesn't just appear in artistic interpretations of reality. It's present in our everyday real life too. In 2015, protests broke out after a cell phone video was released to the public of the moment that Nicholas Robertson was shot 33 times by police officers while walking away. But as the protests kept growing, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department decided to do something about it and released a new video of Robertson holding a gun. Soon, the news followed their lead. They gave ample coverage to the police side of the story, that he was a persistent threat who had been shooting before they arrived. And slowly but surely, the protest died down and everyone seemed to forget about the terrifying incident. That is, until about two years later, when even more videos emerged that utterly disproved the police's claims. Robertson hadn't shot the gun at deputies. And in fact, the gun wasn't even loaded. It had all been a lie developed by the law enforcement's public relations team and exacerbated by the news consistently covering their side of the story without doing any further research to confirm its truthfulness. And we see this a lot, and believe it or not, it is just another form of propaganda. Police all across the country have developed communications teams purely so that they can draft the right message and the news seems all too willing to rely on their lead rather than doing any type of background research to discover the true story. You know, the story that might make the cops look bad if people found out. While some say that the fast moving nature of the news is the culprit for this phenomenon, others say that the police press operations nearly always put forth a storyline that makes officers' actions appear justified. And we've seen this multiple times. In fact, it's so many times we can't even count this shit anymore. Police are praised for their efforts even when they did the worst thing or sometimes even more terrible, like the case with Uvalde, nothing at all. After that tragic shooting took place nearly a year ago, the original story seemed to praise the officers present for their heroic actions. The governor, Greg Abbott, even made a specific point in a press conference to hail the quick response of the valiant local officials. In part, he said, as horrible as what happened was, it could have been worse. The reason it was not worse is that law enforcement officials did what they do. They showed amazing courage by running toward gunfire. And we can all have a very solemn chuckle because the news would come out that the police had not in fact run toward gunfire as Abbott claimed. In actuality, over 300 law enforcement were on scene that day more than the amount that literally defended the Alamo. And yet it took them more than an hour to actually stop the shooter. There was no leadership no communication, and no one ran toward gunfire, except for some of the parents. That, that's who went in there to go and save children, the parents, not the police officers, because they were fucking afraid. And I know there are some tasty boot munchers that maybe are still listening, though I doubt it at this point, most of the yummy, yummy boot lickers stop at around 10 to 12 minutes, I've noticed. However, if there's one in here still that's going, but Blair, it's very scary, okay? Shootings are very scary. I know, I know shootings are very scary. That's why these police officers take that job with an understanding that it's to protect the citizens that they reside over. That was literally their job. They failed, 
their fucking job. Like, I don't know how much more clear to make that. Okay. Is it scary? Yes. Is there potential that they might be hurt on the job? Yes. And they know those things, but you know what they decided to do instead? They decided to just let the children become fucking Swiss cheese in that school because they were very scared. I have zero fucking sympathy for them in case you can't tell. Now, while some of the news about this abhorrent failure at Uvalde came out relatively quickly, it took about three months before investigators released the entire story, which was enough time that it seemed like the general population had moved on from it completely, which that's a whole fucked up phrase on its own. But anyway, so what may have been a protest if all of this information had come out that same day seemed to garner way less outrage than it rightfully deserved. More often than not, police are portrayed as always being right there at the right time, doing the right thing and saving lives. Meanwhile, others are vilified and crime rates are over-exaggerated in an attempt to make the views of law enforcement more favorable in the wake of calls to reform the justice system. After all, if it bleeds, it leads. And it's unfortunately true. We like bad news better than good news. But when the FBI crime data report is released, you can almost always count on the news to take the worst possible statistic and plaster that bad boy everywhere, ignoring literally everything else. In 2021, when the data was released, The Washington Post, New York Times, NPR, NBC News, The Hill, and The Guardian all had headlines focused purely on the rising homicide rate, but they failed to mention the other statistics that told a completely different story. Sure, the murder rate did rise in 2020 compared to the year previously, but homicides were actually at record lows in the country, especially when we compare it to the homicide rates of the 80s and 90s. Of course, they also didn't seem to consult any professionals on the subject like public defenders, social workers, academics, or researchers. Instead, they turned to the police and let them spin the narrative to, as Scott Hedinger, the public defender and executive director of Zealous says, use their failures to demand more resources, funding, and more support. Because at the end of the day, it always comes back to the mighty, mighty dollar bill. There's more to this issue than just that. And we'll talk about that more in just a second, but back to the crime statistics, because there's more to that than most people know. For one, most cities don't even report their crime statistics to the FBI. So they're automatically not the best judge of how the country is doing crime-wise. Oh, and the definition of what a crime is in that famous report that was developed by, you guessed it, police chiefs over a hundred years ago. So when you hear crime is up, it's almost always referring to cities that are committed by marginalized people and almost never by the wealthy. Tax evasion isn't counted, environmental crimes aren't counted, stealing wages from workers, none of that is counted. Crimes that are included in that crime is rising narrative is almost always defined by crimes committed predominantly by the poor, AKA the people the police actually target. Because remember kiddos, white collar crime is apparently not real crime until it is, then, then it's crime, but it's not counted in those statistics because you know, that would make everybody look bad, you know? So maybe the next time you hear the narrative about how dangerous cities are getting or how crime ridden the United States is, go ahead and take a moment to look deeply at that narrative. What are they actually saying? And where is that data actually coming from? Most importantly, what story are the people talking about crime trying to tell? Over the years, propaganda has had a profound effect on how our society functions, and it impacts a lot more than you would think. Media is one of the most powerful aspects of how we develop our view of society, and it plays an important role in our development, even when we're kids. So when we see propaganda everywhere, from the news to major TV shows to kids' programs, it can be a little bit more than just concerning. When we see propaganda on TV shows constantly, our ability to discern the truth from fiction becomes increasingly more difficult. When shows like Cops, for example, predominantly depict white police officers arresting people of color, viewers of the show are more and more inclined to believe that people of color commit substantially more crimes than they really do. In fact, a 2007 analysis of the cop show found that nearly 62% of offenders who were shown on screen were men of color. The show was also far more likely to show men of color as violent and white men as nonviolent. This in turn gives viewers a completely warped sense of reality. It's a complete overrepresentation of the crime that is actually being committed in the real world, and it makes viewers develop an understanding that people of color are far more likely to be violent than white people. And it's just not true. Let's look at mass shootings, for example, because that's always a fucking fresh topic here in the US for some reason, wonder why. For the last three decades, over half of the mass shootings in the country were committed by white shooters. But 
No one wants to have that conversation for whatever reason. This type of media is also the primary example of law enforcement for many Americans. Only 21% of Americans who are 16 or older have ever experienced interactions with police officers. Therefore, the media may be legitimately their only way to develop an understanding of policing. And that can be a pretty terrifying thought when we look at shows like Law & Order that show police committing illegal or immoral actions for the greater good. People who only see this develop an understanding that it's perfectly fine for police to break the law as long as they get the bad guy. Not only does this impact them if they ever happen to have interactions with police, but it also impacts their ability to understand the general problem with police brutality. And think about it. How many times have you seen a news story focused primarily on the background, criminal history, or badness of someone who was harmed or even killed by police officers? We definitely and very clearly saw it with George Floyd. How many times have you seen people say something along the lines of, well, if they didn't wanna get hurt, they shouldn't have done X, Y, Z thing? Yeah, that comes from the understanding that police brutality, lawlessness, or immorality is a necessary evil to catch bad guys, no matter the cost. In turn, this has completely undermined people's ability to call for reform. Who cares if the police are breaking the law and hurting other people as long as they're protecting us from criminals, right? When people called to defund the police, the first arguments were, well, who are you going to call when something goes wrong? Manufactured crime statistics in the news make cops seem vital in protecting social order and lead to an increase in police budgets and a decrease in calls for reform or abolition. We've seen it in New York this entire past year. Over and over, news source after news source has released crime wave reports and the police budget has absolutely exploded in response. Now, by the way, it's about $11 billion a year. And even with that, they have exceeded their overtime budget by over $400 million just this year. And again, we're not even halfway through the year. Our view on law enforcement is completely warped by the media and it's definitely time for a change. After the George Floyd protests of 2020, some shows were canceled and others were reevaluated but we still have an abundance of work to do to get the propaganda off of our screens and our news sources. Everything isn't perfect. And that's especially true for the criminal justice system. And again, I encourage everyone to look a little bit deeper and do a little extra research when you just suddenly see a blatant statistic popped up like that. Why is it like that? Why is the news reporting it like that? And for the love of God, please don't rely on TV shows to warp your view of reality. It's ultimately just propaganda. But with all of that being said, that is where we're gonna end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date with all the latest episodes. Thank you so much for joining me to the end of today's episode. I know this one's a little longer than usual, but I think it was very worthy of the length all the same. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.